Do you see my hand? Do you see my whole hand? Or do you only see the side that I'm showing to you? For over almost one and a half years, there's only been one side of this story that has been advanced by the government, by the media. But today, members of the jury, this week, you will now hear the other side of the story. There's been many interviews by alleged victims in this case, but there's one victim who has not said one word yet, and that is Mr. Theodore Edgecombe. And you will hear from him in this case. To the prosecutors, to my colleagues on the defense side, to the Clearman family, who our condolences remain, and to the Adscombe family. Good afternoon, members of the jury. I am attorney B. Ivory Lamar, and I am joined by co-counsel in this case, if you wouldn't mind standing, Mr. Attorney Anika Mott, and the defendant in this case that we so are delighted to represent in this case, Mr. Theodore Edgecombe. It is our pleasure to represent Mr. Edgecombe in this case. It is an honor and a privilege to give what we call our opening statement. If you've had an occasion to go to a movie, you know what there, you see what's called previews of the coming attractions or sneak previews of things that are to come. This is supposed to be a guide or a roadmap, if you will, as to what we believe the evidence will show in this case. As an officer of this court, in the course of my remarks this afternoon, I would expect to tell you as honestly and as forthrightly what we believe the evidence to show. As the court has so appropriately indicated, what I say is not evidence. It is just used to aid and guide you as to what we believe the evidence will show in this case. Now, we started this process yesterday through a process called voir dire. And during that process, you heard a lot about, a lot of talk about justice. And just two days ago, we celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King. And I don't think anybody has said it is better than him as we talk about justice. And he said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So we are now embarked upon this search for justice, this search for the truth, this search for the facts. Each of you made a number of promises during the void deer process, and all sides of this case are extremely happy to have you a part of this jury. Abraham Lincoln said it best when he said, the highest act of citizenship is jury service. And you're embarked on that jury service today. And it doesn't just stop with you coming down today, taking a few notes, and listening to the evidence in this case. It only stops if you can and will reach a verdict in this case, a verdict that is based off the evidence and devoid of any, any, any type of uh, likeness or bias or anything that you might have for the defendant. A verdict that is devoid of sympathy or passion against Mr. Edgecombe or any party that is a part of this case. Now, you made these promises, and we are mindful of those promises, and we expect that you're going to keep them. Now, we know that you're going to keep these promises and be fair and keep an open mind and decide this case, not on speculation, not on conjecture, not on surmise, but based upon the facts. You then, jurors, are the consciousness of this community. Your verdicts set the standards. You have this rare opportunity, as it seems, to be participants in this search for justice and for the truth. And during the course of this trial, you will likely reach one of the most important decisions of your life. And within that decision, people all across the world can say, this system works. This was a fair trial. These were fair people. So again, thank you for your time, your consideration, 
in the verdict that you're likely to render in this case. Now, the state came up here, and again, they gave you one side of the story. And at the onset, we want to make a couple things very clear right at the beginning. The defense in this case will be straight shooters with you. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, Mr. Edgecombe is not perfect. He makes mistakes like any other, any other person. And there's three things that we want to talk about right at the beginning of this trial. Number one, Mr. Edgecombe, at the time of September 22nd, 2020, was in possession of a firearm that he was temporarily restricted of based off of a bill order that he had in other cases. We want to go ahead and get that out at the beginning. That's a fact. You will not hear any dispute about that issue. Number two, Mr. Edgecombe on September 22nd did in fact punch Mr. Jason Clearman. And that punch was as a result, and you'll learn in the evidence, as a, was a result of racial slurs that came from Jason Clearman. Number three, you will hear evidence, and it would not be a dispute in this case, that Mr. Edgecombe did not turn himself We in. need to squeeze in a quick break. You will not miss a thing. We're going to resume that opening statement by defense counsel as soon as we come back here to Court TV Live. happening now in Wisconsin in the case against Theodore Edgecombe. Opening statements. The prosecution has presented their opening and now defense counsel is arguing opening statement to say self-defense is the reason that Theodore Edgecombe shot and killed the victim in this case. Let's go back to court. Not apprehended until almost six months later. Let's just get that out the way. Now, the state in this case will try to convince you that that was because of consciousness of guilt based off his actions on September 22nd. The evidence in this case is going to show otherwise. Now, the state has talked about several parties to this case. And I, we got Mr. Edgecombe's dirty laundry out the way now. Now that's done. But the other participants in this incident that occurred on September 22nd Let's talk about them. What the state has done is they've shown Jason Clearman in the best light. They've shown Miss Evangelina Clearman in the best light. They've also, they've also shown the Milwaukee Police Department in their actions in investigating this case in the best light. Well, members of the jury, here's the other side. Welcome to the dark side. Welcome to the side where a woman who is married to her husband for over 25 years, where she sees her husband laying on the ground, never tries to save his life, never tries to apply pressure to stop any bleeding. The evidence is going to show in this case she never administered CPR. She never took one physical act whatsoever to try to save the man she claimed and purports to love. The evidence is going to show in this case that the same woman, the same wife, never even called 911 to try to save her husband's life. That's what the evidence is going to show. The state just came up and they talked about video evidence as it relates to this case. Video evidence is very important in this case. As you are aware, there are three incidents that took place on September 22nd. You're going to learn of the first incident. The first incident where, in, in, our, in our view of the facts, obviously differ. But you're going to learn in evidence that the Clearmans were out drinking. Drinking heavily, as they often do. You're going to learn that Jason Clearman, at least, had a blood alcohol level of a 0.12 which is almost one and a half times the legal limit. You're going to learn that he also had THC in his system. If you're not familiar with THC, oftentimes associated with marijuana, weed. You're also going to learn that the clearments get into a vehicle. After drinking, they don't call an Uber. 
You're going to learn the evidence. They don't call a lift. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you're going to learn they didn't even call a taxi, if you will. But they decided to get into a vehicle and operate that vehicle. And long and behold, they come into Mr. Edgecombe. Where was Mr. Edgecombe coming from that night? Well, the evidence is going to show that the last thing on Mr. Edgecombe's mind was first degree intentional homicide. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Edgecombe was engaged in, in trying to prepare what he re will refer to as daddy-daughter date night. You're going to hear evidence in this case that Mr. Edgecombe has five children. He has a special relationship with each one of his children. And he has one night that he designates for each one so that they can further their relationship so they can get closer. On this night of, of September 22nd of 2020, his daughter wanted to have sushi. So Mr. Edgecombe gets on his bicycle. He goes to a place called Dynamite. He places the order for sushi for himself and his daughter. He actually placed that order. He paid for that order. He, now this is during, obviously, the beginning of the COVID, um, the COVID, and a lot of restaurants and businesses at the time would not allow patrons to come inside the restaurant, so you had to wait outside of the restaurant. They told Mr. Edgecombe it would likely be 30 to 40 minutes before his food would be ready. So Mr. Edgecombe says, well, trying to use time efficiently, I'm going to now go try to pick up dessert. I'm going to go to a place called Folio, go grab some yogurt so that they can have dessert to go along with the sushi for daddy-daughter date night. Well, his plans changed when he ran and came across the clearance. The evidence is going to show in this case that as he's riding his bicycle along, he was not coming in direct, going the opposite direction of the clearance. He was riding his bike along. The clearance just leaving from at a bar, operate the vehicle, they're going down the street, and there's a vehicle that's parked. There's a vehicle that's parked, ladies and gentlemen, that has their right turn signal on waiting for a parking spot. Well, the clearance grew impatient. So what did they do? They come over and they go into the opposite lane of traffic, coming into direct contact with another vehicle. Then they swerve over. And they, that's when they struck Mr. Edgecombe. Mr. Edgecombe lands on top of another vehicle. And that's not the end of it. Part of my language, members of the jury. They did not say, however, quote, Theodore Edgecombe, you won't miss a thing. When we come back, we'll resume right where we left off here on Court TV Live. Out of the state of Wisconsin, we know that Theodore Edgecombe, the defendant in the case, shot and killed Jason Clearman, the victim. The question becomes, was it self-defense or not? And right now, we're listening to closing argument by his defense attorney arguing that here are all the details leading up to what happened and the reason why the defense is this was done in self-defense, meaning it would not be a murder conviction. Let's go back to court. At that point, the Mr. Edgecombe got very upset. It's a very offensive word. Now, Mr. Adcoe will testify and, and explain that as a bicyclist, this is not the first time that he's almost been struck by a vehicle. That is not what bothered him. Mr. Adcoe is going to explain it's the use of that racial slur which set him over the top. So he's not just going to get food and just find a car and just go punch somebody. He goes to the car, he asks Mr. Clement, were you talking to me? Mr. Clement says, yes, racial slur, I was talking to you. And that's when Mr. Edgecombe punches Mr. Clement. Now, 
We, we make no justification for that. No doubt about it, Mr. Edgecombe should not have taken matters into his own hands. He should have called authorities for them to handle the situation. We, 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 there's no qualms about that issue. We don't deny he should have handled that matter differently. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Hedgecombe is charged with first degree intentional homicide. You're gonna learn in this case that Mr. Hedgecombe, after he makes the punch, he gets back on his bicycle immediately. He gets back on the bicycle, he's done with it. The way he handled it with the punch was not the best way. We see punches in basketball games, we see them in baseball games, and we most definitely see them in hockey games. It's not, doesn't justify it, but Mr. Edgecombe gets back on his bike. He's done with it. Back on the daddy daughter date night. Time to go get the yogurt, come back to Thad and Mike, get the sushi, continue on with his night. Nope, the evidence is gonna show the Clearmans had different plans. The evidence is going to show that the Clearmans also did not call 911. The Clearmans could have went straight after this incident. They could have, you know, got a description. We've clearly seen Mr. Edgecombe being here today. The technology existed through video to capture him. But instead, they went straight. They, well, they didn't go straight. They didn't make a left turn. They didn't make a U-turn. Instead, they didn't just follow Mr. Edgecombe. The evidence in this case is going to show they chased Mr. Edgecombe. The evidence is going to show in this case, Mr. Clearman says to his wife, follow him. And Ms. Clearman, no objection. She does exactly what her husband says, and she follows Mr. Edgecombe. She comes down the street. The evidence is going to show she's in the middle lane and she's making a legal right turn in the mid middle lane. The evidence is going to show in this case that she turns the vehicle, the motor roars on that vehicle, and she's now turning that vehicle not into the two lanes that are completely available to her. She turns going directly in the direction of Mr. Edgecombe. And she accelerates aggressively and violently directly toward Mr. Edgecombe. That's not following. Members of the jury, the evidence is going to show they were chasing Mr. Edgecombe. The evidence is going to show in this case that before the vehicle even stops, Mr. Clearman is almost already trying to get out the car already. The evidence is going to show he didn't just get out to go for a nice jog. As Ms. Clearman has told many media outlets, the evidence is going to also show he wasn't getting out to go talk to Mr. Edgecombe either. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Clearman was violently pursuing Mr. Edgecombe. Now, <clears throat> we talked about video in this case. We now know, members of the jury, you can expect to hear evidence that there were three incidents in this case. However, only two of those incidents were caught on video. Well, let me correct that. Only two videos were provided from the government in this case. There's video evidence. There's, you're gonna learn that there's a video at Casablanca, which would have captured the first incident. We believe, members of the jury, the evidence is going to show that that incident would have occurred at 7.45 p.m. Does the government give us video showing us 7.45 p.m.? No. You're going to learn, does the, giver, does the government give us evidence showing the videos at 7.30 p.m. from Casablanca? No. The video that the government provided in this case begins at 7.47 p.m., two minutes after which time we believe the incident would have occurred. No explanation. It's just missing. Members of the jury, the second incident, Obviously, where Mr. Edgecombe now punches Mr. Clearman, 
You might guess the government has the full video of that incident. You'll see it in evidence. You'll see the full video. Let's talk about the third incident. As Mr. Huebner just came up and he, he talked about the poll cams that would have caught both incidents. They have two different cameras going two different directions. Well, you're going to learn, members of the jury, that the incident, when the detectives arrived, when the medical emergency uh, individuals came, that they were on scene approximately almost five hours. I mean, this is a homicide. There's unfortunately a deceased man that's laying on the ground. B.I. Ivory Lamar is setting out for the jury what he expects the evidence will show for this defendant. And he is saying it will prove self-defense. Stay tuned. We're going to take you right back to these opening statements on Court TV Live. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcott. Always my honor to be with you. The jury was seated just today in Wisconsin versus Theodore Edgecombe. And now opening statements. The prosecution was fairly brief. We're going to take you back into court where the defense attorney is making his argument that the evidence is going to show in this case that this was an act of self-defense when the road, ra road rage rather incident resulted in the murder and death, or at least the alleged murder according to the state, and the death of the victim in this case, Jason Clearman. Let's take you back to those opening arguments. Members of the jury that out of five hours, five hours of potential video, you're going to learn the government doesn't give us the five hours of video. You're going to learn, members of the jury, that the government doesn't even give us four hours of video. Not three hours, not two hours, members of the jury, not even one hour of that video showing the investigation in this case. You're going to learn, members of the jury, that the government only provided one minute and 34 seconds. One minute and 34 seconds of video. We're missing the other five hours. That's what the evidence is going to show. Now, you might ask, what is the significance of the rest of the video? Well, members of the jury, as we talked about, we've only talked about one side of the story. Well, let's start talking about the other side. The evidence is going to show in this case that immediately after Mr. Edgecombe leaves the scene, within six seconds, see, the media has been showing one part of the video of that one minute and 34 seconds. The part that has not been released is the other half. And the evidence is going to show in the other half, Ms. Clearman, six seconds. After Mr. Edgecombe runs off, she gets out the car. She runs over to the body. She's not running over to the body as the evidence is going to show to save his life. She reaches down and she tampers with something. The evidence is going to show. It's going to be on video. See, this is the other side of the story. This is the other side of the hand. She runs back to the vehicle, and she closes the door like nothing happened. Members of the jury, you're going to have to figure out why. Members of the jury, immediately after that, you're going to see a vehicle come into frame. You're going to see a red SUV. This red SUV comes into frame, and it pulls alongside Ms. Clearman at the time. This is right about the 1 minute and 34 second mark of the video. And all of a sudden, the video cuts off immediately as this red SUV gets aligned with, the, with Ms. Clearman. And it cuts off. Why it cuts off? I don't know. The evidence is going to show that that video did not cut off coincidentally. They only cut the video off at 1 minute and 34 seconds for a reason. You're going to learn what that reason is. Who is driving that red SUV? Well, the lady in the red SUV, her name is Stephanie Trotter. She's going to be a very important witness in this case. 
You're going to learn that there's three people that called 911 on September 22nd. You're going to learn that one of those individuals was Stephanie Trotter. You're going to learn that when Stephanie Trotter, she observes Ms. Clearman on the phone, not with 911, you're going to learn that Ms. Clearman is on the phone with Anna. So instead of calling 911, the evidence is going to show Ms. Clearman called Anna, whose boyfriend or husband is a police officer. Now, you're going to learn that Ms. Trotter got in contact with the defense in this case. She called the state. She called the police officer. She called 911. She talked to a detective on that evening. And the detective said, well, if you have any other information that you want to tell us, let us know. Well, Ms. Ms. Trotter is going to come on the stand and she's going to explain that what she saw that evening was Ms. Clearman getting out the car, running over to the body, which would be a second time, not to save Mr. Clearman's life, not to administer CPR, not to apply pressure to a wound, but she's rummaging through Mr. Clearman's pockets. The evidence is going to show Ms. Trotter is going to come on this stand and she's going to explain to you, members of the jury, that Ms. Clearman was running through Jason Clearman's pockets immediately after this incident. <laughs> members of the jury, Stephanie Trotter contacted the Milwaukee Police Department Homicide Unit on the evening of September 22nd of 2020. And she informed the Milwaukee Police Department what took place and what she observed. In the Milwaukee Police Department, you know what they said? Thanks for the information. Have a good night. Thanks for the information. Have a good night. Now, you're going to learn as in voir dire, you heard the state talk about witnesses that they expect to call in the, on this case. Well, you're going to learn that there's three people that called 911. You're going to learn that two of those people that called 911 is on the state's list, but one of them is not. And that one that's not, you're not going to see the state call Stephanie Trotter in this case. And you, members of the jury, have to figure out why. Members of the jury, it doesn't stop there. 43 minutes after Mr. Clearman is laying on this ground, the detectives are on scene now. The police department is on scene, medical is on scene, the Milwaukee Fire Department is on scene at this time. You're going to learn that there was, you know, a witness that one of the officers said, you know what, I've seen him standing there. I believe he has information related to this case. I need to go over there and talk to him. Sounds reasonable, part of the investigation. You're going to learn in this case, members of the jury, that there was one officer that said an excuse. We got the wife. We got one person that called 911. We got enough. And then you're going to learn, members of the jury, the body cam cuts off. Members of the jury, this case is about this. Members of the jury, that was 24 seconds. I know it might seem a little bit awkward. That was 24 seconds. The evidence is going to show in this case a video of Mr. Edgecombe trying to evade the violent, aggressive aggression of the clearance for 24 seconds. That's just on the video. That's what the video is going to show. That's 
what this case is about. That's what the case is about. The decision that Mr. Edgecombe made at a particular day, at a particular time, at a particular moment. You're going to learn Mr. Edgecombe describe Mr. Clearman getting out that vehicle. You're going to learn Ms. Clearman yelling out the window as well. You're going to learn him getting out, not just going for a jog, as the state alleges. He wasn't just going for it. You're going to hear in evidence that Mr. Jason Clearman was chasing Mr. Edgecombe, yelling out more racial slurs. That's what the evidence is going to show in this case. The evidence is going to show from Mr. Edgecombe's standpoint that Mr. Clearman has something in his hand at the time he gets into a boxer stance. Mr. Edgecombe is going to describe what he was feeling. He's going to describe what he saw in his perception at that very moment. The evidence is going to show that it just wasn't a boxer stance that Jason Clearman got on, but it was a lunge. A lunge that took Mr. Clearman almost four feet when Mr. Edgecombe backs up to avoid being tackled by Mr. Clearman. The evidence is going to show, you're going to hear from the medical examiner in this case. And you're going to learn that Mr. Edgecombe did not, the gunshot did not go off in this case five feet away. This will be five feet, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You're going to learn Mr. Edgecombe did not, there was no shot that went off at a five foot distance. The evidence is going to show from the medical examiner that at most, the gunshot in this case went off at two feet. Two feet? This was the, this was the maximum distance. The medical, the autopsy report says that it was from two feet as the max to several inches. Members of the jury, this is six inches. This is what the evidence is going to show. The gunshot goes off at the minimum of several inches. Mr. Edgecombe, when he testifies, he's going to explain to you that the last thing he was thinking about when a gunshot goes off, when he's trying to avoid being tackled, by a man that's over 60 pounds heavier than him was what he's going to do a month from now or what he's going to do three months or four months from this very moment or as the state talks about the six months this was the last thing he was thinking about what he's going to do six months at this point that's what the evidence is going to show he was thinking about how he's going to get home to his family at this time that's what the evidence is going to show You will not hear evidence in this case that during the time frame of six months that Mr. Edgecombe was not apprehended, that he was somewhere on the beach drinking mimosas. You're not going to hear that. You're not going to hear that he was having some grand vacation or having a grand time over the course of these six months. What you're going to hear is that Mr. Edgecombe was actively seeking legal representation. You're going to hear that Mr. Edgecombe was contacting lawyers all across this state to try to find representation, because one of the reasons that he ran, as he's going to tell you, is that he was scared. He was scared not only of the police department, who might I add, labeled him immediately as the Brady Street Killer. Mr. Edgecombe is going to tell you that he contacted lawyers he contacted organizations and that he was on a quest to try to raise money so that he could afford legal representation in this case. You're going to have it. We're going to get the evidence in this case. That's what the evidence is going to show. Members of the jury, I want to thank you at this time for maintaining an open mind. I want to thank you for your attention. I know that this jury pool will take great notes. 
and that justice could be rendered in this case equally, impartially, and without bias. Thank you.